So I'll talk about Dirac materials and magnetism. And uh, yeah, I have to join the other speakers and the participants. I think it's the right balance of the kind of time to talk and time to discuss offline, actually. So thank you, the organizers, for this interesting setup. So I'll talk about the uh, Dirac materials the way so like we define them. And uh, I would believe that actually I don't have to tell you this audience that we see this emergence of a pretty powerful emergence of the, like this nodal states, call them Dirac, call them, call them while, which uh, probably represent the kind of very interesting class of materials. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the way how I view all the Dirac materials. And then um, uh, if it's a class, actually, the, 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 the reason to, to talk about this as a, as a class is maybe actually to come up with some common description, common features. So in addition to pretty kind of like important discussion on topology, I'd like to emphasize that uh, uh, we have plenty of spectroscopies in both in real and momentum space. And those are the ones we use to identify the phases of matter here. So there is no topological STM. And so one has to look at something that comes out in these measurements. And uh, what I'd like to uh, point to is an uh, interesting uh, set of measurements that can be done in real space on direct materials. And there are some common features. So basically, I'll talk about the local defects as one example of highlight this commonality, as opposed to a lot of this common thread where people discuss kind of like features in the band structure. Uh, and then we will move on to the future, which is now. <coughs> and we'll talk about the extension of the Dirac materials to, uh, to the case of bosons and magnets. So essentially, talk about the artificial materials. Not, or not the artificial, but the materials hosting the bosonic excitations. Uh, all right, so I'll use the graphene largely as a framework. Uh, uh, let me start with electrons. Uh, the, Significant fraction of the talks, or most of them, or a lot of them, were spent uh, discussing the, the, the nodal lines and nodal points in the electronic spectrum. Uh, I don't have to explain to you what is shown here. This is a Dirac spectra or Weyl spectra for, for graphene, um, or for other like, nodal excitations in the, in the metals. And uh, what's, uh, what's of point of interest is this uh, very interesting uh, crossing point where you have a few Few power, few spectra, few 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 lines and dispersion kind of coming together. So what I see is that um, uh, first, what kind of materials I can, like I would call Dirac materials? The ones where we have a nodal lines or like a point point points in the excitation spectrum is a reasonable suspect for 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 Dirac materials, be it topological or be it just symmetry enabled. Um, and as I said, the conversation goes around some like, uh, f interesting. Uh, features in the um, in the uh, in the momentum space algebra or like al interesting algebraic topological structures that emerge in momentum space. For instance, kind of people talk about the Berry phase. Uh, so some of the materials are trivial, but in this definition, for instance, graphene is trivial, but nevertheless is Dirac. It depends what you mean by you know these days everything is trivial. I mean topological. So graphene is topological as well in this regard. Uh, but um, at least the way, the way I view it, the topology might be actually additional sort of plus in this. But we're looking at the features uh, near the Dirac nodes. And those might come as a result of pure accidental degeneracies and still would make, make up for very interesting properties. So what is the conversation goes in into sort of like a commonality if I talk about the class? So what are the common sort of features? The first, uh, because of the shrinkage of the phase space, you have low-lying excitations whose power count is different from the Fermi liquid. So the scaling of density of states is different. And therefore, as a consequence, you have a whole set of the single particle properties which have a different scaling behavior compared to Fermi liquid. So you can think, of, think about this as a marginal uh, Fermi liquid case or a marginal metal case where you have a conductance, but barely so, if the chemical potential is near this Dirac node. So there is a whole set of actually uh, interesting transport observables uh, that result from this uh, uh, vanishing phase space. And the previous talks covered some of those conductivities uh, plentifully. Um, so let me try to attempt to define a little bit better what, what I mean by Dirac materials. Um, so imagine they have a, a perfectly translationally, uh, translationally variant system. I have a brilliant zone. And I'm asking, actually, to find out the set of points, locus of points with a low energy states 
where the cost, energy cost for quasi-particles goes to zero. And uh, usually it defines like some Fermi surface around which I can define particle hole excitations. In the case of Dirac materials, you do have particle hole excitations as well. Uh, but what's interesting is uh, uh, the set of these uh, points where you have uh, uh, low-lying excitations is not defined by the typical co-dimension for, for, the, for the metal. So if you have three-dimensional dispersion and you impose the conditions that energy should be zero counted from the Fermi level, then you have one constraint on the three-dimensional function. So it usually paints the surface, hence the name Fermi surface. So in this case, you can think about this. Uh, you, you tune the system by whatever field to the point where the Fermi surface shrunk to a point or to a line. So it means that the dimensionality of the zero energy states is one less than it should be in the metal case. So you have a full expectation to have metallic behavior, but for some reason, you have a dimensionality of low-lying states that at least is one less than what it should be, like d minus one, and now it's d minus two or d minus three. And uh, as we know, there, is, there should be some profound reasons for that. It does have an accident. You don't lose the whole integer dimension by chance. And so the way I rationalize it uh, is that indeed there, is a, there are some constraints and you can view the Dirac points or Dirac lines uh, as a place where, for instance, you have a spectrum with some quantum numbers which allow for these lines to cross without opening the gap. So there is a symmetry enabled crossing points. But then, of course, there are sometimes topological features or topological reasons for these lines to cross. But nevertheless, the symmetry is also there. And so even in the absence of topology, the symmetry itself can actually generate the Dirac nodes. Now, uh, why, and like I said, these days everything is topological, so Dirac and wild metals are also topological. But I thought actually, in a trivial sense, if I calculate some global index of the brilliant zone and some of the Dirac materials, I'll get zero. And nevertheless, I will have the Dirac points which are very interesting. So, uh, that's why I put in that the class of Dirac and wild metals are broader than topological. So, but I'm perfectly fine for this to be equal or greater the other way around. Maybe there is many more topological states which are non-Dirac, non-wild, as, uh, for instance, uh, might be the case as uh, Bernick was saying today. So, uh, why bother with these states? I think actually if we indeed are serious to build a device based on these crossing points, a couple of points, a couple of historic, uh, issues to take advantage of uh, these points. If there is a symmetry protected points, I can come and I should leave the symmetry, suppress it, and I can open and close the gap. And so therefore, if I look for some functional material, I can control the behavior response of this material by opening and closing the gap. And for instance, belief is that uh, if you put magnetic impurities in topological insulator, we can open the gap and create the like, anomalous quantum hole state. And another one is uh, typically uh, in the real world you would worry about the loss and dissipation. So these kind of like nodal states are inherently less lossy. Again, because the phase space for particle holes uh, uh, excitation is less than the metal. All right, so uh, obviously Dirac point is interesting, but we already see this evolution of the field, for instance, in graphene where a lot of uh, effort goes into functionalizing graphene and developing actually interesting applications based on the nodal point. And so how you functionalize materials, you apply external fields where you can move the chemical potential. You can apply magnetic field where you can probably open the gaps. One can put some dopant atoms uh, uh, to actually induce non-trivial behavior, like in this case, for instance, when you put magnetic impurities in topological insulators. Or one can functionalize it by placing this Dirac node into restricted geometry, for instance, using so like some ribbon geometry, where the finite size quantization will lead to some interesting effects as well. So what's shown here, for instance, is splitting of the Dirac cone uh, at about quintuple layer of bismuth selenide, where you have a five kind of like layers with the open gap, five states with the open gap. All right, so as I said, uh, within this kind of general conversation, I can find out a great deal of similarities between wild metals and Dirac metals. But if I look at the, uh, most of the conversation, it goes into essentially transport and k equals zero, like the like global properties of these materials. 
So I'd like to do the following. I'd like to spend some time telling you that indeed if it's a, if it's a concept is a class, <laughs> then the similar kind of, uh, common features should be seen in the response, real space response, very localized response of Dirac materials, okay? And so for that, I'd like to focus on impurity states. And the consequence of this would be, where I'm going with that, I will tell you that uh, if uh, Dirac materials as a class holds up, and if there is a kind of some features, common features in response to defects, then magnetically doped topological insulators should not have a gap. Okay, I know this is a strong statement, so stay with me and then we can discuss what I'm saying is wrong or what I'm saying is right, et cetera. So let's do it. Uh, as I said, there is a plenty of uh, facilities around the world that gear to probe the materials in momentum space. We have synchrotrons, we have uh, uh, neutron scattering facilities. So there is a lot of characterization matter happening in this K space. In this case, it's ARPES spectra, famous ARPES spectra of Dirac cone on the surface of, topolo surface of topological insulator. So what is also known is that the very same sample, bismuth selenide, if you plot it up and STM shows this feature, basically, if you look at local tunneling spectra or uh, topography on the, on, the, uh, on the bismuth selenide, you see some defects. You see some features, actually, which are localized. So in this particular case is the data from Hanaguri. I'm sure Ali Yazdani and others can like, see very similar things. And so the question is, how do we interplay this with the observation of the Dirac cone? So you see, if I don't show you the, this blue panel, everything is very nice and clean, but at the same time, there's clearly something going on in the real space. So motivation for us first was actually we can look at the effects of defects and probe the stability of the topological phase. And I'm not arguing that the topological phase is not stable, but nevertheless, what I'm arguing for is that there is a sort of like very profound modifications of electronic spectra at low energies for Dirac nodes regardless whether it's topological phase or not. So let me start with fermions first. Uh, the very first example I would list is uh, something you might not know, is a case of a zinc dopant in the, in the bismuth, uh, bismuth oxide, bismuth copper, copper based superconductor, BISCO 2212, where you go in and replace one copper in a square lattice and then uh, you see this resonance. So the, this is a case of the, if you want Dirac material, which is extreme case, it's a D-wave superconductor. So it's no longer metal. It's an unconventional superconductor. And uh, the Dirac node lives at the energy scale when you talk about, say, energy scale below 50 millivolts. So it's a huge difference compared to graphene bandwidth. But nevertheless, it's a Dirac point. And Dirac point in this case comes because uh, when you put the quasi-particle at the Fermi surface, and as you go around the Fermi surface, you have a gap that should go through the node because you get from the go from plus to minus. And so there is a certain place where in effectively like Bagalubov degen equation, you will have to have both diagonal and off-diagonal pieces of the Hamiltonian vanish, and this would be the source of the Dirac point. So in that case, uh, basically these Dirac nodes are responsible for like low-lying spectra in the part of the spectrum more tunneling conductance at low energies and responsible for all sorts of interesting behavior. Then, um, uh, so let's do the following. Let's take one defect and place it inside this superconductor, one inside this uh, Dirac material. So it's known that impurities suppress superconductivity, but in case if you have one only, clearly the damage should be done locally. There is no global suppression. And so if I have one impurity per, say, cubic centimeter of sample, the damage will be done only so like locally here. And what you see locally is that there is a resonance that moves in inside from the continuum and start populating the gap. So you kind of see already the precursor of the gap filling because of impurity states and ultimate collapse of superconducting state. This is a U Shi Barusin of state, but version of it in the D wave superconductor. Okay? If I fully gap the spectrum, I will get this resonance. And then there are some reasons why there you get another resonance here on the opposite side. And this would be your kind of like YSR resonance as people talk about. All right, so there is no difference between these resonances in the D-wave superconductor and, and going forward in graphene and TI, and essentially, uh, except in this case, it's a marginal gap. It's an incomplete gap, and the gaps in the S-wave superconductor. What's interesting about this effect, what's interesting about this resonance is that when you look at any unconventional superconductor and you look at the local scattering problem, 
in any solution for the uh, scattering, you will only see, I mean, what was engaged is essentially the normal, normal part of the, of the Green's function for the theories in the audience. This electron, when you inject it into the site, and you look at the local T matrix or local resonance for conditions, does not know that it tunnels into the D-wave superconductor. And the reason being that on site, anomalous function vanishes. So for all intents and purposes for the local statements, <coughs> this uh, tunneling process is no different than tunneling into graphene. And that's already, you can see the seed of universality. <coughs> that it doesn't matter whether it's a kind of superconductor, it doesn't matter whether it's a, so like a um, P-wave superconductor, there will be similar resonances there as well. And they're very similar in nature to graphene and TI resonances. Anyway, what I'd like to point here is uh, the scaling of this resonance is inversely proportional to the strength of impurity. So it's a very unusual feature. The harder you drive the potential, the harder you sort of hit it, the more infrared the resonance is. Okay, and there are reasons for that. Maybe we can go through this a little bit in a second. And sure enough, this resonance has been seen experimentally in STM. And Ali was one of the pioneers in this field, including Shu Heng Pang, Shumas Davis. So this came at about the same time when this very powerful technique of STM was applied to high DC superconductors. So this was actually back about what, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Now, um, so back then when we were looking at the effects of the defects, I thought we were so solving superconducting problem. I didn't realize that we were solving Dirac resonance problem. So then, uh, let's move on to graphene. In case of graphene, what we have is uh, essentially a single defect. Graphene comes in very pristine, very clean, so you have to work hard to create defect. And what you do in this particular case is the data from, I believe, from Madrid, where they irradiated graphene to knock off atoms. You just do ion bombardment to create artificial vacancies in there. So what's then the, what happened is that you have this kind of like defect in the sea of otherwise kind of like graphene electrons. And sure enough, you have this resonance forming up and essentially a nodal point. And uh, that's the data. So the top panel here is the data from 2010. And the bottom is actually some theoretical calculations which are fairly, fairly straightforward to do. And you see it's kind of consistent with the data. So then actually, let's talk about impurity resonances in the Dirac material, namely topological insulators. You have a Dirac cone. So it's legitimate to ask, actually, what's the response of Dirac cone to topo in topological insulator to defects, especially given that this is a topological matter. There should be protection. There is a protection against 180-degree scattering, i.e. backscattering protection. I just want to point out, to get the interference pattern, I have to sum over rolling angles. Even if there is a keratoid backscattering protection, in the case of TI, there is no protection against scattering 179 and 181 degrees, and so on and so on. So this backscattering protection works as a charm, like a charm in one dimensional case, but unfortunately it doesn't suppress completely this effective back interference in two dimensions. All right, so just to sum up this, uh, the message here, uh, here are the panels, well, all of this is data, there's impurity resonance in graphene. There's impurity resonance in the D-wave superconductor. And this is spectroscopy of a local defect in the bismuth selenide from Hanaguri. And uh, this actually asymmetric nature of the, of the density of states is consistent with the asymmetric nature of the ARPES intensity, which is steeper above the Dirac point, and then actually it gets flatter below the Dirac point. So it directly relevant, it relates to the kind of how density of state changes here. In all of these states, when you put the strong enough defect, you produce a resonance. Now, again, going ahead, I'm going to tell you that if I put the bosons on the honeycomb lattice, I will produce the Dirac dispersion for bosons. I will produce Dirac bosons, right? And so then the question actually just for in this context would be that if I have, I will be talking about ferromagnets living on the honeycomb lattice, where you have a Dirac, uh, effective Dirac dispersion for the magnum, uh, then uh, when you put a defect there, you will have a localized magnum state. You will have a basically localized defect that looks very similar to, to others. All right, so uh, as I said, the impurity resonance scales inversely with, with the potential strengths, and this is a unique feature of Dirac and Wild. Why it works out? 
Uh, well, first of all, you can solve it yourself. It's a pretty straightforward calculation. But let me show you graphically what's going on so you can see how robust this statement is. Uh, and for that, I need to do some kind of simple key matrix calculation. So uh, let's look at the density of states, which is actually capped between of the winds W. And I pull down this flat metallic density of states and create the Dirac node. So I have a density of states with suppressed linearly vanishing density of state, uh, Dirac node, like in graphene, for instance. Let's talk about two-dimensional case. Though this is an on-site problem, it doesn't care what dimensionality is. It does care about this energy scaling at the nodal point, though. So if this is a imaginary part of my Green's function, namely density of states, then the real part will have two logarithmic singularities at the edge of the spectrum. And inside this notch, this red line, or this yellow line, is essentially the, the real part of the Green's function, which has the shape of this marginal Fermi liquid. It has the same well-known omega log omega behavior inside. So then actually, if I look at the conditions for the pole, uh, then you will find out that for large U, I have to draw a low-lying horizontal line and look at the intersection points. That's how I graphically would solve this equation for the condition for the pole, this equation. I should say that I'm looking for the pole of T matrix. And so the deal, the game would be, you come and tell us what, what U is, and then I do some calculation. In this case, it's graphical calculation where I'll tell you what the, what the typical energy of this resonance would be. Omega is a function of U. Now, so there are a couple of places where the solution can occur. One of them is outside of the uh, upper edge of the continuum, which is uh, this true anti-bound state. This is the beginning of upper Hubbard band. If you have a lot of this U physics going on, and then on every side, then you have some crossing point here. But the imaginary part is so much larger than the real part. This is a very broad resonance. You don't see it. And then you have a resonance here. And this is a resonance people see ubiquitously in a lot of these nodal states. Okay. So this one and this one are relatives in the sense that if I were to come and start filling up the states, spectral intensity of this resonance will diminish, and the, the, this, uh, the, the resonance outside the gap, outside the continuum, will gain. OK? And so if U is actually not as strong as before, the crossing point will move out, and you get a fatter feature. So the idea is the trend is uh, you have at high energies fatter, less defined, less sharp resonances, and but bigger in spectral weight, and then as you kind of increase the impurity strength, it slides down uh, until at unitarity it reaches actually zero, zero energy or near zero energy. There is no true mid-gap state. These are intra, intra gap states, if you know the difference. So it turns out this, is a, this calculation can be repeated for the wild metals. The difference is that, of course, it's no longer the linearly vanishing density of states, but nevertheless, in the wild, you can have many terms by which you parameterize impurity scattering. You can do intervalley, intravalley of different kinds because you have many generators. But nevertheless, you do see resonances in while as well. And so I would say that uh, the while would be prone to formation of sort of like a lot of these uh, low-lying states. Uh, this is not the artifact of any of the uh, simple analytic approximations. You can do DFT calculations, and you see those resonances uh, robustly coming in. So in this case, we look at the vanadium uh, impurity in the antimony telluride. And you can see this kind of states. And you can see the departures from the parabolic band with some slight bump. So on the difference, uh, it, would, it would show up as a well-defined resonance. OK, so what I promise you is that uh, I'll try to build some, some commonality in real space. So that's what I'm trying to say, that a lot of these nodal states will respond to these defects in this fashion. Why bother with defects? Why I'm telling you this? There's a beautiful conference, there's beautiful topology all over the place. It's because basically semiconducting industry is based on the fact that uh, you, you functionalize the material and you take advantage of impurity band. Okay? So if some of this game is to be played going forward in topological materials, this will be important. You cannot build device on ideology. Eventually it has to work in spite of the disorder. Okay? So um, what I would, would like to do now, apply this knowledge or whatever this glean of knowledge may be beginning of understanding and talk about this framework as, as a predictive framework. So first, I, I develop a hammer. Now I'm going to apply it to magnetically doped topological insulators. Uh, as we've seen is a number of times, here is an example of the gapped state of, uh, well, I forgot what the material. This is a Kikun-Shi's group. 
This is a science paper, one of the first or the first paper claiming the appearance of the, of the um, anomalous quantum hall effect in the film where the only transport occurs on the edges of the sample. Uh, here is actually the, the, the gap is shown pictorially. What's the reason for this gap? By the way, it's a very simple calculation. If you have a two-dimensional so like, uh, metal that moves uh, with, with a direct dispersion and then you come in and uh, apply magnetic field or effective magnetic field produced by localized impurities, all of them pointing up into SZ, you engage in the third Pauli matrix and this becomes essentially the Hamiltonian of the particle in external magnetic field which has all three components. And because of that, actually, the, the Zeeman spectrum of this particle of spin one half will be proportional to that magnetic field, and therefore it will be non-zero. So the gap opens up. Now, going what I'm going to tell you, I think actually this is a flawed logic. Uh, so here's a gap. It's here. How do you know it's a gap? Look at this, because basically they pointed right here. <laughs> now. Uh, if you look at the intensity a little bit closer in the data, this is Yuli Chen. What you find is actually you have a big, big peak, and you have a tiny dip, and this dip is a gap. Okay, so technically, as a matter of principle, there is no suppressed intensity at the direct point in the data. But the color choice is such that actually if I cut it off right here, you'll see the dip, okay? Um, it is known fact that actually to date, Essentially, with the exception of, I'm aware of only one exception. Unfortunately, it's a Shemus Davis, who is a very good group, claiming that uh, there is a gap on the surface of the magnetically doped topological insulator. Majority of the groups do not see in the ferromagnetically ordered TI the gaps as they tunnel in. So here is an example of the, uh, something we've done in collaboration with Paolo Sessi and Matthias Bode group in Würzburg. So we look at the uh, this is again the same logic about the gap opening. What you can show is that in the presence of magnetic scattering, but also with the potential presence of strong enough potential scattering, you do still have generated resonances. Okay, so escape hatch here or escape close is that actually if U is much less than J, you don't generate the resonance. At least in this simplified like one band model, uh, U should be bigger than J. Typically, it's very easy to satisfy for any realistic impurities you put in. So in this case, I think it was a chromium in antimony uh, telluride topological insulator. They show clearly that uh, in the data that this is a ferromagnetic order state. So let me just finish here. So you, you have this resonance, and then when you have like few of them, you start filling out this gap. Okay, so that's what uh, I'd like to say that there is a plenty of opportunity to fill the gap by placing magnetic impurities in TI. And that's after the properly, so like broadening the lifetime, broadening this, the states, that's what you get. You get remnants of this resonance, but also the filling of the states everywhere in the gap. This is the data. This is line cuts of STM. Uh, all of these impurities have the same trigonal shape. Uh, sometimes it shows like a double bump. Sometimes it shows a single bump, depending on the impurity sits. Uh, this is the tunneling data. If you zoom in, you will find out that there is no gap. There are some, some, some action going on. There is a final conductance at any temperature, and it's not exponentially small as a function of temperature. Can I ask you what, what would happen to this picture if the magnetic impurities were somewhat ordered? Like if they formed a lattice? So would the, the picture was filling the gap in all these resonances? Uh, yeah, you still will start, have to deal with the band, with the regular impurity <laughs> band inside. This is actually pretty much my case for vanadium doped in, the, in this case. This is a supercell calculation. All right, so uh, I just want to point out, basically, you, you look at this thing, and it's, um, here's an example, Kikuchi, very good group. Uh, they talk about the mass acquisition of direct fermions and magnetically doped TI. Here's the data, this is zero field data. You see some bump. This is a magnetically ordered topological insular where the claim is that the gap exists. I don't know. So let me just, uh, let me just point out something actually, but fields seem to, to be forgetting. I'm not here to pontificate. There are p people who can tell it about this better, but basically very cursory look at the quantum hole effect. I just grabbed some hand-drawn figure from Bell Harper's lecture. 
20 years ago or 30 years ago. Taking a conventional high mobility, very large mobility, two-dimensional electron gas supply magnetic field, you have Landau levels. And then actually when you turn disorder, Landau levels broaden. Once they broaden, we still know that observationally there is a anomalous quantum, sorry, there is a regular quantum Hall effect. So what it means is actually there are some regions where you have a mobility edges. And then when you park a chemical potential here, you have a one sigma xy, and then you park it here, sigma xy changes because chair number changes. But otherwise, if you tunnel anywhere in this two drag, you never see the true gap. And so basically, this is a standard knowledge in the context of the two drag community. Something goes on in the TI because basically apparently there is a like prevalence of the claims about the gapping of the spectra. Uh, most of the, I should, say, I should say, drawn from the ARPES and the STM again are in sharp disagreement with the, with the declarations of ARPES. So something, well, we're clearly dealing with some disagreement where we, once we solve it, we'll learn something important and useful. But it's not the point actually to shy away from this disagreement and not acknowledge its existence. Unfortunately, actually, like a lot of these local probe guys have a hard time actually getting results through. So anyway, so here's the, let me tell you the, what the fallacy is with this logic, okay? So you start with the Hamiltonian, you put impurities in random, you put potential part and magnetic part. That's what I would do in a simple one-band model. Then here's the logic actually what's happening. We know that if impurities are dense enough and all that, I can replace this impurity kind of potential by average density, and I can replace impurity spin by average spin. And of course, we know that the shift of chemical potential in this model is irrelevant. And it's true in the metal. That's why in the metal, you look at only magnetic chain, magnetic scattering. You don't look at the potential part because you already have a very large density of states to begin with. And then actually, you proceed from this to get the spectrum. But the net effect of this actually averaging out of impurities is like a net effect of the shift of chemical potential is wrong because as I showed for larger as impurities, the multiple scattering of these defects produces these resonances. So somehow, this whole conversation about resonances is lost at this stage. Okay? Uh, so, inclusion of your list to impurity scattering and impurity resonances. So, what I'd like to do is uh, to tell you that that's actually the, kind of like my reasonable expe or strong expectation that's what will happen in magnetically doped TIs. So, I'm not arguing against anomalous quantum Hall effect. The effect is there. Uh, but I'm saying actually it's not because of the gapping, but because of mobility edges generated by magnetic impurities. Right. or both magnetic impurities and other ones. So let's do this uh, now. So what's the logic here? I said actually Dirac materials is a framework. It's like a hammer. I apply it to, to topological insulators. I point out some, at least some inconsistency, or I point out the resolution of inconsistency based on all the prior knowledge of what we know how Dirac materials respond to defects. So now let me tell you what, what one can do with the games one can play with this concept. So I'd like to actually create bosonic Dirac materials. So motivation to some extent was early on in the discussion of graphene was we finally in condensed matter realized the massless neutrino particle at the tabletop experiment. And then the work of others now is we, we show that we can actually create much more exotic excitations in condensed matter platform, which are not even realized in the field theory, or at least not yet. So the example here would be, I'm going to show you how one might create Dirac, Dirac Magnon or Dirac boson. All right, so application of these ideas to bosons would be the following. You, you first you make a trivial observation uh, that uh, for, say, in this uh, graphene type lattice, non-Bravel lattice, if I put any population on it, any, any single particle hopping on this, it will have the same single particle spectrum as graphene. So tight binding Hamiltonian, because there is only one particle in the problem, is quadratic Hamiltonian, doesn't know about statistics. And it doesn't know about interactions. And so we actually, particles hopping on this lattice will develop Dirac node, regardless of whether it's a fermion or a boson. And examples of the bosons where people take advantage of essentially band, band structure engineering is that people talk about the plasmonic crystals, acoustic, polaritons. And that's what I would like to show how one can build effectively unusual Joseon junction circuits and magnons with Dirac nodes and dispersion. So just to acknowledge there is a kind of like rapidly growing list of other literature in this, in this field. So those are the all artificial materials. Um, let me start first. Or well, yeah, so the, the, the second part of this thing is that uh, the outcome of this exercise will be that there are some unusual surface states in bosonic states. 
in the bosonic or Dirac materials. And it turns out bosonic Dirac materials respond differently to interactions. If you turn interactions in them, they have very different actually behavior compared to fermions. So let me show you the first example, which is known. I didn't bother to look ever at the phonon spectrum of graphene, but if you look at it, you see this Dirac point right here. So what happened, you have essentially a uh, non bravel lattice. You have a two carbon atoms per unit cell. Each carbon can move in three directions. So you have six modes moving around in graphene. And you have like six modes coming from the gamma point, three of them. You have one, two, three, four, five, six. And then actually there are some other crossing points which are also very interesting. But the conventional one, if I, can, if I get about all other bands, actually this is the same as the case of the, of the Dirac dispersion in, uh, in graphene, electronic dispersion. So the proposal we put forth was, um, imagine that you have a granular superconductor. So this is now electronic circuit, but lithographically I created as a, as a superconducting grains made of niobium, but I put them in the non brevet uh, arrangement, for instance, in the honeycomb. So what happened is the same story as before with, with carbon. Carbon, when you take it as a stage of liquid, all carbons are the same. You've seen one carbon, you've seen them all. And then when you put them on the lattice, you endow them with additional topological, so like index, with additional topological flavor that comes from the topology of the lattice. And so the same is happening here. I take a conventional iobium grain, I put them in, and then now I have a grain A and grain B. So if I sit deep in the superconducting phase, that what uh, somebody was talking about, Joseph was talking about the superconducting insulate transition in the granular superconductors. So if I sit deep in the superconducting phase, I have well-established bosons living on each grain, and then I turn on the jobs and coupling between them. And um, so just very simple power counting tells me I have two bosons per unit cell. I have two amplitude modes. Well, of course, basically, one can run ahead and do this. So there will be a couple Higgs modes as well. But uh, if you look at the phases only, you have a center of mass phase, which is sound mode. And they have a relative phase, which is a legged mode. And the language of superconductors is called relative phase mode. So what happened then is that these modes have a different quantum numbers. And uh, you, you allow them to cross at the K point, where K point is set by the wave vector by typical period of the structure you create. Uh, and then in the case if it's uh, charged bosons, they have to gap at, at, the, at the zero. And this Dirac cone will have very interesting uh, Berry, Berry node and the chirality and Dirac structure here. So I kind of like do see the, the emergence of this, this spinorial <coughs> bosons in the context of these artificial Dirac materials. Now, yeah, let's not talk about this. Basically, the idea here is that if you have a neutral uh, boson living on the honeycomb lattice, there will be sound mode of some sort, but then when you turn on, What's interesting here, the, the, I'm just showing this for the following reason. It already has a seed of explaining what will happen. When you turn on interactions with the bosons, the dispersion flattens. And this is in contrast to the Coulomb, effect of the Coulomb interaction in graphene. So we'll, we'll come to that if time permits in a second. So as I said, actually, the similar logic would apply to take a honeycomb lattice and put the magnons on it. And you will have uh, some Dirac dispersion for the magnets in two dimensions. So let me just borrow this honeycomb structure from graphene. I have A, B, and B sub lattices here. And then uh, where I'm, what I'm trying to do is actually try to build uh, the real 3D material. And then I will show you the, the real physical realization of this material. But nevertheless, just to remind, and maybe Valodio already mentioned, is that uh, there is a whole set of stacking of graphene layers. And so, for instance, you can have, from a, starting from a single layer, you can do the Bernal stacking where you do A, B, A, B, or you can do A, B, C stacking. And so what's happening with A, B, C, you only come back to the conventional con configuration uh, on, the, on the third iteration. And so what it means then, that there's quite a bit of atoms that actually that are misplaced from the relative actually properly, so like properly aligned, color aligned, so sub lattices. So you have to go three times before you recover uh, the previous structure. So, I'm not going to show you the, 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 the calculation, but uh, what happens, we assume the large spins. If you assume the large spins, we assume that one can take the mean field uh, approach and use the Holstein-Primakov description of the spins on this lattice. 
The difference of the fermions from bosons is that if you have a next nearest neighbor exchange, so if you have a honeycomb lattice that's magnetic, so excites in which you interact, uh, next nearest neighbor exchange generates on site terms. And this having to do with the fact that actually this SZ, SZ term, aside from standard S pluses minus, it looks like a conventional graphene hopping term. SZ, SZ term will generate on site terms. And uh, it's actually important. Uh, uh, for the creation of the surface states. Okay, so the surface states and these magnets will be created because of this actually difference in the environment because of local interaction. So another fact is that if I have uh, uh, this uh, ABC stack graphene, magnetic graphene, and I come to the surface, what will happen is some of the sites will have a counterpart to interact exchange uh, with, the, with the spins downstairs, but not with the, with, with the spins up. And so as a result of that, this term J, which was isotropic before, it has both counterparts up and down, will look to the magnetic magnets living in this media uh, as an extra term, diagonal term that comes in into play uh, because this J now will be missing for some of the sides actually looking upwards or trying to, to do the exchange with the spins up uh, above them because of missing row, missing, missing layer. Um, what it means is that uh, in principle, we find that, um, well, anyway, so, so there are some, 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 some social here, here kind of arguments about the generation of this uh, drum head state. But there is a surface state which is dispersive. And this surface state actually leaves at K, but will be actually uh, present at the surface of, the, of, this, uh, of this honeycomb magnet. So what it has to do with anything? Well, first of all, you can build this artificial material, but then it turns out that there is a very interesting example <coughs> of the layered stacked honeycomb ferromagnet. We happen to come across something which is uh, called uh, chromium trihylides. There is a series of them, chromium bromide 3, chromium iodide 3, chromium chlorine 3. And most of them are ferromagnets. I think there is one exception, probably chlorium. But otherwise, most of them are ferromagnets with a ferromagnetic temperature of about uh, 30, 40 Kelvin. And what happened is actually it's a very well separated set of layers where, uh, sorry, set of layers where you have uh, essentially a large spin, maybe, uh, I forgot the value of the spin, maybe three halves uh, where you, of the chromium spin where uh, they live on the honeycomb lattice. So let's start first, well, what was, was not known already back in the 70s when the people look at it, uh, this is a data from, uh, all the group, uh, like it's um, Brookhaven results going back to 60s. It turns out even Shirani and others were looking at the neutral scattering in these materials back in the 60s. Uh, those materials are also interesting because they have very unusual Faraday effect and care of care rotation. Uh, care effect and Faraday basically in uh, um, the, anyway, th there might be some interest for, for uh, optical application. So they already noticed that there is some crossing point. Of course, back then they didn't talk about the Dirac, so like dispersion or behavior, but they knew because of the number of nature of the lattice that you have some crossing point here. Um, the paper itself didn't receive attention at all. It's uh, the paper from 1971. It was, to date, it collected a great total of about five citations. Um, and why it's interesting is because they notice the following thing, the following fact, that they see that there is a strong evidence for the wave vector dependence of the shift of energy that would come from the high order spin wave interactions, i.e. spin wave correlations. Uh, I should say that uh, if you go back, if you look at the textbook examples, ferromagnets are usually declared to be boring because there is a Dyson theory for the ferromagnets uh, and uh, basically it tells that there is a, like a net self-energy effects that there is an overall global renormalization of the spectrum, but otherwise uh, there is very little actually, uh, so there is like essentially a homogeneous effect independent of K. This is coming from some Dyson's calculations back in the 50s. Um, so I would say that back, going back to, going forward to the age of Cooper race, actually Phil Anderson used to say, at least I remember him talking, that the Fermi is boring because uh, the operator commits with the, with the Hamiltonian, the order parameter, and so you can basically describe everything without any frustration. And then antiferromagnets are much more interesting. So I'd like to bring to your attention that actually magnets on non-bravel lattices are very interesting. 
And the ferro magnets on the Borealis is a very interesting. And it's not because the magnets are trivial, but because basically you're giving forcing topology on the magnets by the nature of the lattice. So what they see in, in this data is a very strong temperature dependence. So look at the difference between 6 Kelvin and 20 Kelvin going along a certain line cut. There is a significant change, temperature dependent change in the scattering. And then if you move away from the sweet spot from this particular point, there is very little change. So what they showed in this data is that uh, here is something like a dyson hartree fox theory estimate of what the lifetime and the net energy shift should be. So you have a magnum magnum interactions. You have a real imaginary part. The real part will control the shift of the spectrum. The imaginary part will control the lifetime. And what they notice is that there is a clearly some non-homogeneous uh, or momentum, strong momentum dependence change in the self-energies. Um, so now I'm bringing up this uh, interaction aspect of the Dirac material for fermions versus bosons. Uh, you probably remember that in the case of, uh, of graphene, there was a discussion about renormalization of Dirac velocity as you approach the Dirac point. And uh, so something one, one can do is actually estimate the self-energy part. This is a K log omega, K log K, which is kind of like, because of relativistic invariance of Dirac point is the same as omega log omega I was showing you before. And from that, you can back out logarithmic renormalization of velocity, namely this uh, solid cone shows that actually the velocity steepens up as you go to Dirac point as a result of Coulomb interactions. So the question would be, would the same effect occur in the case of magnons? And I'm going to tell you no. And the bosons and the magnons, um, they lead to the kind of interactions of the magnons lead to the flattening of the dispersion. So there is a qualitative difference. So at the level of two particles, basically all the Dirac materials look the same. And the moment you look at the, at the bosons versus fermions, there will be changes. I mean, there are some other reasons why there will be changes as well. So anyway, one can calculate something. Basically, we, we did the calculations for to the fourth order using all these kind of terms with the proper coherence factors. And what you find is that, indeed, there is an overall renormalization of the spectrum consistent with the Dyson prediction. There is a quadratic term uh, that leads to the shift, or if you want, basically, uh, shift of the energy and change of the dispersion, the bandwidth. Uh, but then uh, what's more interesting is that uh, this uh, non-trivial diagram leads to the both real and, and imaginary parcel energies which have elevated response near the Dirac point. So it has a kind of like some feature near the Dirac point. Uh, what is shown here at the top panel shows the imaginary part. You can see M point as usual this aspect actually has a lot of this because of one whole nature of M point. It has a lot of, so like scattering going on there. And then there is some, some features coming in the K, in the decay rate. And you have different actually branches for the scattering. And then uh, related to that, for the decay rate, there is a real, real space energy normalization. Sorry, real, real, uh, uh, real part of self-energy normalizations, which control the, the, the dispersion. So what we find is that if you plot it for some range of choice of parameters, uh, this is actually a 3J. This is about the temperature maybe of 30 Kelvin or so. What you find is that you have uh, um, uh, uh, quite a bit of renormalization of the, like, of, the, of the dispersion and all sorts of like unusual features in the dispersion of the quasi-particles magnons because of this one whole feature, sort of like sharp peaks in self energies. So the point is that actually the, the magnons actually lead to the flattening of the dispersion as a result of interaction. Then when you apply this um, calculated self energies, we can reasonably feed the data. Um, there is no new data, unfortunately, to show you, but uh, what it does seem to indicate that there is a great deal of scattering and great deal of self energy coming right before you hit the Dirac point consistent with the data. So what I would like to conclude here is actually Dirac, Dirac velocity is lower than the chromium bromide 3, and then appearance of Van Hove peaks here and here, and then uh, these results agrees reasonably well with the experiments, unknown experiments from 1971. So the, 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 the suspicion I might have here is that maybe if you look at the uh, surface probe of this material, you might see the drum head states. You might see this unusual kind of elevated susceptibility because of this uh, quasi, quasi non-dispersive state of the surface. So if I want to be optimistic, I would say that this is maybe the case of the magnetic case of bismuth selenite. You know, some samples sit on the shelf for 40 years 
until somebody actually decided to look and measure the surface properties and find out non-trivial, essentially topological features. All right, so let me conclude with that, actually. I told you that uh, the, the idea was uh, to take uh, the, by now, reasonably established concept framework of Dirac materials. I showed you that at least I, I push it to the point where I believe it's predictive, and my, my, like, my prediction is that magnetically doped topological insulators do not have gaps, technically. If words have a meaning, and when, if you, if, if you agree on the meaning of the gap, then TI do not have gaps. They might have mobility edges, but no gaps. Uh, then uh, once we actually use this to, kind of, to play back with already uh, some with the, with the materials which are established experimentally, uh, turns out that extending this notion of Dirac material subbasonic sector is not so exotic. Uh, phonons in graphene is one example. Myomagnons in transition metal halides is another example of this Van der Waals material with a Dirac dispersion. And then, uh, so we have a dispersive surface state now, and uh, the, this idea that. Uh, Self-energy corrections for the bosonic and fermionic Dirac materials look very different uh, is an interesting observation as well. So at this point, I'm, thank you. I'm ready to take questions.